Okay, joining us now, NBC Sports soccer analyst and co-host of Men in Blazers, Roger Bennett. His new book, Reborn in the USA, an Englishman's love letter to his chosen home, is out now. Roger, congratulations. Oh, so, uh, Roger, you. you know, I, I have... Um, I've been wanting you to write this book for a long time. You know, we've as we've discussed on there, I think people know, you know, we've been watching, you know, for over a decade, we've been watching football matches uh, together. And when you and Joey Scarborough and I and others would sometimes get together, you would talk about what it was like landing in America. And, and it, for Americans, it's hard to realize this. You love Britain. You love uh, the country of your birth, but you say that every time you touch down at JFK, you just, you feel something magical. You still, after all these years, you feel the energy and the belief that anything is possible. Talk about that. I grew up in Liverpool, the most magical city in the mm. world in the 1980s, when the city was truly rotting away. The north of England, the coal mines had shut down, the steel mills, the cotton mills, and this once great port of Liverpool, which used to take English products out when we had an empire, had fallen silent, a little bit like Baltimore, but without the crab cake upside. And so the city was falling apart, there was unemployment, there was hopelessness, there was a heroin epidemic, and I survived this life lived in black and white, Joe, by inhaling everything American. I could get my hands on the music, the books, copies of Rolling Stone, the television shows, the mighty Chicago Bears Super Bowl winning team. And they showed me that there was a possibility to live a life different to my own, where life could be lived in colour, with hope, with courage, with tenacity, with joy. And I persuaded myself, even though I'd never been to America, Joe, I persuaded myself I was just an American trapped in an Englishman's body. And my book is about that journey, that journey from being a kid who had the Statue of Liberty painted on his bedroom wall and the Manhattan skyline to actually living here, having an American family and ending up in a courtroom saying the... Uh, the oath of allegiance and becoming an American, which is the greatest day of my life. Can you talk about that moment? You, 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 you describe it so movingly in the book where uh, everybody that's in there to be sworn in as American citizens that day, uh, it happened to the first person uh, who went up uh, and after it was done, uh, people started applauding and, uh, and, and tears started rolling down the faces of all of these people from different parts of the world uh, understanding that something remarkable had just happened. Joe, I wrote the book at a time of challenge. Sports had stopped, lockdown had begun, the city of my dreams, New York, was the world's pandemic capital. And when the challenge of the present is incredibly dark, it got worse, the Black Lives Matter summer, the pain of that into the toxicity of the election. When the present is full of challenge, you humanly retreat back to times past in which you drew strength. And so I did write this book about the idea that's animated my life, which is the American idea. And that idea, when you are in a courtroom, as I was in the southern tip of Manhattan, with 62, uh, 162 people from 43 nations, many of whom had got through civil war, had, had, had escaped famines, had had terrible journeys to get here, my, making mine, which was just escaping a few late night beatings in a chip shop on a Saturday night in Liverpool, seemed tame by comparison. But when you stand and say the Pledge of Allegiance in that company, you look left and you look right and you see the idea of America is what drew each and every one of us. And there were tears throughout the room. And that idea, I mean, the reality of America is full of challenge. But that idea of America, Joe, of hope, of courage, of tenacity, of belief that there could be a life that's very different to yours around the world. And I did, I, one of the motivations for me was to try and express that feeling, and exp a feeling of deep gratitude that I feel to this day. Yeah. But also, to, you know, at the, the 2017, there was a Pew Foundation report which really shocked me that um, Western Europe, 47% of Americans, only 47% of Americans had a positive uh, connection to America. I found that devastating as a, you know, as a gentleman that was born, reared and raised on American soft power. Mm. Yeah, there's so, so many immigrants. Uh, you talk to immigrants uh, that have gone through the process you went through. If you want to be inspired as an American, 
That's a great place to start because they do believe in the dream of America. Uh, for the most part, and, and, and I've heard it time and again. I want to talk really quickly about soft power. Uh, you know, we, we grow up in high schools and, and colleges, and we read about American soft power, our Western soft power, whether it was Beach Boy albums or Beatles albums, uh, bootlegs being smuggled behind uh, the Iron Curtain, and actually that and blue jeans having an impact. You, you, you talk about how American soft power drew you to this country. And the list, uh, it's great. Love Boat, Fantasy Island, Heart to Heart, Miami Vice, Rolling Stone Magazine, John Hughes Movies, Chicago Bears, Run DMC, Beastie Boys, and of course, the incredible Tracy Chapman. Um, but, but soft power the only really queen did. I believe it. American soft power had an, had an impact on your life and pulled uh, you to America. Absolutely in every way. You know, I was in Liverpool. It was a dark and twisted time. Tracy Chapman took the stage at Nelson Mandela's birthday concert. She was only flung on because Stevie Wonder's synthesizer blew up. I remember watching at home. She was flung on this unknown uh, by the organizers of the concert. She was just armed with her acoustic guitar, 72,000 drunk English people. They wanted to hear, I just called to say, I love you. But Tracy, while Stevie Wonder kept doing a sound check, <laughs> wandered onto stage, leant into the microphone, and just started to draw mystical strength from the opening chords of Fast Car. And when you watch that, she silenced 72,000 drunk English people, which is not easy to do, as you know, Joe. She drew mystical yeah, strength and she turned Wembley Stadium and, into the most intimate setting possible. And when you heard her message, which was, do not stand for what you currently are grappling with, make bold changes and get out while you can. When you are like a 16 year old and you hear that message, I mean, it is, it's because of Tracy Chapman, it's because of the Chicago Bears winning Super Bowl team who, who said, yeah, we've been a terrible team for 20 years. We've self-sabotaged, we've failed, but we don't have to be what we are. We can flip the script, we can create a new narrative. Each of these things, they see Seemed funny on the surface, Miami Vice. That, that, that was only about cops and drugs on the surface. That's like Animal Farm was only about horses and pigs on the surface. Below it, it was about being a singular human being, committing to a style, pastels, no socks, espadrilles, just being <laughs> yourself. And you watch that as a kid and you're like, all the lessons of life are in there. And it sounds flip and it sounds ridiculous, but when you watch this from a place of hopelessness, um, it teaches you the lessons about life. They are breadcrumbs through the enchanted forest that luckily for me have led me well, to live in New York City and to a place where they allow bald men on television, which is the ultimate liberating freedom. Roger, thank, congratulations on the book. Um, <laughs> as I listen to you, it's, it's so refreshing to hear this in, in this particular news cycle. But I'm reminded of a line from a poet by the name of Yusuf Komenyaka, an idea grafted to a shadow. You've lived in this place in a very dark moment. How do you square this understanding, this rendering of America in light of what you've seen in this place over the last five, six years? My idea, the central idea of America was one which I had as a child. I am now an adult and the idea is not the reality. And your lines of poetry are utterly beautiful. And the epigraph of my book is possibly the most beautiful line. Well, it's not possibly, it is. It's, I choose a, a line that could absolutely destroy everything else I wrote. And it's the lines from Langston Hughes, which are, let America be America again, the land that never was and yet must be. Mm. And in that discordance, mm. that's what we mm. are. I mean, I wrote, released this book ahead of Independence Day and every Independence Day, I think about those lines, the discordance in those lines. And I do ultimately want to dedicate myself, and I think millions of your viewers do too at home, want to dedicate themselves between closing the gap between those two lines of the great Langston Hughes. So, Roger, uh, same question put differently. Um, uh, for, for those who, and we, we mentioned um, a, a poll, you know, people who are not necessarily seeing the American dream uh, right now, in this present moment in time, in this time in our history, going through our democracies, going through a little bit of a challenge, that could be an understatement. But what do you think you're seeing that those who poll differently are not seeing? right now and, and what can you share what is it is it the hope of america 
Yeah, I can only say that being in that courtroom and then voting for the first time as an American on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, that, that, that pandemic election, 5.30 in the morning, getting to that line to vote. And Mika, this is the end of my book, the epilogue. To, mm. I, I'd never voted before. I'd never had that incredible joy, that incredible responsibility. And I turned up at 5.30, masks on, uh, to vote in the darkness of a frigid Manhattan um, early morning, and it was a line, just in a, a line, very much like the security line to my um, mm. to my naturalisation ceremony. And I stood in line behind a 93-year-old African American woman in a wheelchair that was covered in um, in American flags. She'd never voted before, but she wanted to get up early with her caregiver to make sure that she was first in line to vote. And the excitement and the sense of possibility in that line, you know, I draw strength from that. And I also draw strength from the fact that I called my friends in England who I used to share the dream of America with. I felt devastated. It's why I wrote the book. What was this dream? Really, what was this dream if this is the current reality? And there were fireworks going off in London the night the election was called. And I said, what are you, what are you celebrating? You know, the dream we had as kids, what, what were we really believing in? And the last line of the book is my best friend, who is the through line in the book. He said, there's parties in, in, in London, in Berlin, across Asia. Mm -hmm. He said, there's parties even in Paris, which was hard for any Englishman to believe that the pa Parisians were happy for anyone else. And I said, what are you celebrating? And he said, we know, that, like any dream, it's not perfect, but we can dream again about America. Mm -hmm. And the last line of the book is, the world is a better place when it can dream about America. Mm -hmm. And I absolutely believe that's true, Mika.